noted that we have one of Phyllis's books available. And um, Gail Kelly, who is um, doing the bookstore today for her husband, Ed, who usually does it, has to leave at five. And I wonder if we have a volunteer who's willing to um, sell books at five for a little bit. Gary? Okay, Gary Davis will be selling these at five o'clock in the, in the back, and Phyllis will be glad to sign them, I trust. And uh, they're wonderful books. I read a little section at the beginning of the meeting about her near-death experience. It's wonderfully described in here and very openly and honestly talked about and how it's affected her life, and I really appreciate that. It's terrific. <coughs> wonderful book. She writes beautifully about her life, and you um, shouldn't miss it. Good book. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think we're ready. <laughs> Um, I happened across uh, Phyllis's name and, and learned that she was a near-death experiencer uh, a few months ago. I don't know exactly when it was, but uh, I was just thrilled to learn that because this woman is considered an authority on religion in America today. She's written 24, at least 24 books, maybe more, and uh, on the subject, she's often quoted in New York, New York Times and other uh, major publications uh, as as an authority on the subject, and this is a subject that, of course, touches all of us deeply because when you have a near death experience, you come back with very altered ideas of what religion should be, and she has had a near death experience, and I just think this is the most wonderful combination of things possible, and I. Picked her up last night, we had a wonderful time. She's such a delightful person, and I know you're going to enjoy her. Please give her a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is this one, uh, this is mine. Yeah. Uh, my uh, maternal grandmother, so it didn't do me any good, uh, was Jewish descent, and the DNA still remembers, and I can't tell you my name without my arms. Uh, if I'm using one of these things, you're just reeling. Um, this is loud enough. Can you hear okay? Is that one working? I, I also tend to wander, but with a big one maybe like this. I, I'm a recovering academic, among other things. You don't ever get over it. But uh, I get behind one of these things, and uh, I think in 55 minutes sound bites, and you don't want that. Um, you, really, you really don't. Uh, I, I need to uh, clear up a few things. First of all, you all look like a bunch of Episcopalians. What, what, whatever happened to, to, to coming together and down? I say, what's about speaking to the world with a lot of ocean and just a few islands? Um, but, but anyway, if you're comfortable, it's fine with me. Um, I, I want to clear up. I, I, I first of all want to say that um, when Diane Call, which was I guess a year ago now, uh, I was enchanted by the, first of all, I didn't know there was such a thing as a, an association of near-death studies or experiencers or weirdos, as the case may be. <laughs> uh, then to discover that it was an international uh, obsession uh, was a delight. So, and I, I said to her right from the first, uh, I can tell you my experience in 20 minutes, and that's going to leave us two hours and 10 minutes in which I have nothing to say. And she said, I don't think so. Uh, and so she's probably right. Uh, the way you write 24 books is by never shutting up. Uh, and by the way, let me clarify, because of your very fine question, what Bill Sweet was saying uh, when he said, once you start, the book project, where did he go? Did he leave? Did he abs abscond? Yeah. Uh, what he said, it's a smart idea not to talk about it once you've started it, is absolutely right. Um, and it's not a matter of um, uh, protection uh, so much as there is an amazing intrusion into your thinking uh, on the part of other people uh, in whom you've tripped some ideas. And it's, it's not in any way aggressive or uh, <coughs> deliberate, it just is how it is. Uh, and I, I want to reinforce, because of the confusion in what was uh, heard, I think, uh, that, that he's right on. If you're writing a book, uh, quit talking about it until you've got it down on paper. It's, it's, a much, uh, it's much better. That from, from experience. Uh, anyway, uh, I, as I said, I said to her, I can tell you my experience in 20 minutes. Um, and 
then realized that I desperately wanted to come and be with you uh, simply because I come as a learner. Um, and uh, 55, 60 years ago, uh, when uh, indeed I had my experience, and there have been other experiences uh, in addition, uh, parapsychological or whatever you want to call them, uh, that I'll, I'll talk about, um, it was not something that one talked about uh, at all. It is a phenomenon of fairly recent time that something like this could even exist, like this organization, or that we could have this kind of conversation. And so I decided at breakfast this morning that I wanted to start with where I am and then go back, if you will uh, allow me. And that may mean that for the first 15 minutes you're bored out of your gourd, uh, for which I apologize, but better to bore, to, to bore you at the front end than at the back end um, and let you go home stiff uh, from the whole thing. Um, and and I, I want to start, and also I think it will clarify uh, a bit. Um, I spend my life uh, now, uh, I, I began as an academic. Um, I, I began with an undergraduate degree in Greek and Latin, deader than which it don't get. Um, <laughs> you need a near-death experience at least once a week. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and why I wanted it, I don't know. The last thing I ever wanted to do was get into the clergy. Uh, but I think I was always, to some degree, fascinated with religion. And it is the business of religion, in many ways, uh, to discipline uh, and to vet and to perhaps course it. Uh, those experiences for which we don't have any other explanation. Uh, the spirit is filtered through some sort of religious sensibility in all of us uh, to some greater or to lesser extent. So I was always interested in religion, but I did indeed. Uh, I taught high school Latin for a year and then went got cured of that. High school will cure you of almost everything. Um, and it will even make graduate school tolerable. And so I took myself to graduate school and said, never again. Um, and uh, finally ended up as a college dean for, for eight years, um, teaching language and literature as an area of, and so in no way uh, connected with religion, other than being a devout Episcopalian. I was reared a Presbyterian, and I got over it when I was 17. Um, and, always will be grateful for those years as a, as a Presbyterian, but became an Episcopalian, which as we all know specializes in bells and smells anyway, and um, so it, it was a, a natural uh, fit for me. Uh, anyway, I, I uh, left the business of being a college teacher in order to uh, go into publishing and some 35, 40 years ago now. Um, and that was the time in which, if it, was, uh, if it was written with a draw, you could sell it, because Southern literature was just really hot in New York. Uh, and I headed a Southern house, and we tried to print with a corporate with a draw, and were fairly successful. Uh, and then it got bought by another house, it got bought by another house, and the first thing you know, um, I, I'm a full-time publisher and an editor, and still wanted to become a writer. So, and long story short, when I was 59, I decided that I was going to quit the publishing business and going to learn to become a writer. And someday I'm going to learn to do that. I'm going to <laughs> succeed at that. Um, and it lasted for 13 months. There is in the uh, publishing industry a very fine uh, journal. It's a trade journal, Publishers Weekly. It's the trade journal for uh, the industry in the English language, international one. Uh, and uh, when by the time you get to 92, uh, those of you who can remember 92, some of you are too young to do that, but when you get to 1991, 92, along in there, all of a sudden, for the first time in publishing history, it's religion, religion books that are on the bestseller list. It's the beginning of the angels. Betty, uh, Betty Eady is going to be overwhelmed by the light before too long. Uh, it's uh, angels. It's all of that stuff. And so in 91 and 92, I am happily trying to become a writer in my little office in Tennessee, well, when the phone rings, and it is the senior the editor in charge of Publishers Weekly saying, Tickle, we're in real trouble. Uh, and I said, yes, and she said, she was a colleague, not a friend at that time, she's become a very close friend since, but she said, um, we don't know what to do with religion. Uh, religion was never published by secular houses in this country until very recently. It was always published by denominational houses or self-published, uh, one or the other, but it was, not, uh, it was not a mainstream thing. And she said, uh, what we've got here is all of the best sellers are now religion, and we haven't got a house in this country who knows how to publish them, and we've got to cover it. Will you come and establish a religion department? They've never had one. And I said, um, 
why me? And she said, just quite frankly, you know uh, publishing, and we think you know God, and it looks like a good combination. And I said, I'm rare to have been more flattered. Uh, and uh, said, give me a month, and she called it a month and said, it's crisis, now come. And any fool, uh, given enough money and a, a serious magazine, and Publishers Weekly, 130 years old, I guess, at that point, and had the money, any fool can establish a department um, in, in, a, in a magazine. I do it fairly, fairly competently. Daisy had said to me, it'll take you 18 months, um, and it, it didn't quite, but what took me the next 10 years, actually it was 12 years before it was over, I quit. I quit finally in 04 and said, this is ridiculous. Uh, became apparent within 18 months that what the real problem was, uh, was that nobody knew what was going on. My real assignment was to talk to publishers and to booksellers and to librarians and to explain what it was that was happening. Why were all of the best sellers now in the field of religion or parapsychology or spirituality or whatever you want to call those things? What was going on and, and why? Uh, and uh, so I essentially left the business of running a department rather quickly and became a huckster on the road. Uh, and there was, it, it was required, I had to have about, um, I'd say, 18 months of serious scholarship um, in which I was paid to just try to figure out what was going on and why it was. And it didn't take a genius to discover that the scholarship for what was going on had been there since about 1907. In 1907, a man named Walter Rauschenbusch wrote a book called Christianity and the Coming Social Crisis of the 21st Century. And he's the first scholar to name what was happening. Uh, that book was so seminal that it was reissued in 2007 in a centennial edition. Um, but from Rosh and Bush on, it was very clear that we all knew what was happening uh, if we were in seminaries or in academies. If we weren't in seminaries or academies, we were clueless because, as we all know, things that stay in seminaries and academies don't hurt anybody. Uh, they just stay there and kind of feed, and feed on themselves. Um, it's not until there's a commercial reason for information to come out that it jumps. And so, uh, by 1995 and 6, I was doing pretty much what I'm doing now. I will quit what I'm doing now uh, in December and go back off the road and uh, write another book, uh, which I can't do on the road. But what I do now, uh, and after I left the magazine, I asked for permission to, to leave. I, I retired, uh, I, I resigned uh, twice, and it didn't work. And so then I retired and said, that's it, I hang it up. When one works for a trade magazine with in, any kind of integrity, one has to deal with the realities of the marketplace. One cannot deal with one's own, especially in religion, it's important um, that your own prejudices not, uh, not inform what you're saying and that you be uh, essentially prejudiceless. Um, and so I grew weary of that because I thought what was happening had much more pertinence uh, to the church, uh, both the Christian church and to Judaism and perhaps even to uh, Buddhism in this country. Uh, and that it needed to be said <clears throat> with some of my prejudices showing. So all of this is to say that my first prejudice is that I am dangerously Anglican uh, and, and dangerously Judeo-Christian. Um, and so that's my first prejudice. The second thing is, what's the nature of the scholarship? The nature of the scholarship is fairly, um, I, I'm going to do in five, I'm going to do 2,000 years of history in five minutes, um, and we'll get it over with. About every 500 years, uh, that part of the world that received its Christianity through the Latin language, or that was colonized by those who had received their Christianity through the Latin language, or more important, was colonialized by those who received their Christianity through the Latin language, goes through a huge upheaval. That is to say, we are in one right now, and the one we're in now right now is called the Great Emergence. Those of you who follow economics, I hope, are aware for Kurt Zakaria, for instance, for Time and CNN speaks of what we're going through now as merginomics. Or I hope you know that Friedman says the world is flat. Or I hope you know that Gladwell says we're at the tipping point. Yada de yada de. Uh, this is the great emergence, and it's got a thousand characteristics, all of which you already know if I were to show them to you. If you go back 500 years from right now, you hit what's called the Great Reformation. And the Great Reformation didn't have to restrict itself just to religion. Uh, if you remember in high school, they taught you the Great Reformation brought you the middle class, uh, the rise of the middle class, the rise of the nation state, uh, the coming of capitalism, and oh, by the way, it brought us that thing called Protestantism, uh, which it did. 
And if you go back a thousand years, you hit the Great Schism, which, by the way, brought us that thing called Roman Catholicism as it booted orthodoxy out of the Western experience. If you go back 1,500 years, uh, you hit the great decline and fall, aren't you fascinated? Uh, which got rid of uh, apostolic and patristic Christianity and birthed monastic Christianity. If you go back 2,000 years, uh, you hit the change of the era, what's called the Great Transformation. Uh, you hit Judaism giving rise to Christianity. If there were a good Jewish rabbi in um, the audience, he would say, and that's not a Christian phenomenon. Because if you go back 500 years from the Great Transformation, what you hit, of course, is the end of First Temple Judaism, the Babylonian captivity, and the birth of Second Temple Judaism. If you go back a thousand years from the Great Transformation, you hit the end of the Age of Judges for Judaism and the coming uh, of the Davidic dynasty out of which Meshua was to come. If there were a good Iman in the room, he would say you're not talking about a Judeo-Christian phenomenon, you're talking about an Abrahamic phenomenon. Because while Islam is only, uh, it's about 650 years out of sync with us, uh, it's 650, the prophet is dead by then, and Jerusalem has fallen, but it's 650 before you can say, ah, there, there is Islam. Uh, and, it is, and so they are about 650 years out of cycle but with us, but they are doing the same thing. All of which is to say uh, that every 500 years we seem to go through one of these things that changes everything sociologically, culturally, intellectually, economically, politically, and oh by the way, religiously. Because it is the function of religion, and you cannot separate from the society in which it lives, it is the function of religion to inform the society in which it occurs and to be informed by it. It's a, it's a, a, a symbiotic relationship that you can't interrupt. Every time we go through one of these upheavals, the question is always the same. The question is, how now shall we live? Where now is our authority? Because what gets lost is our authority. Uh, the form of religion that held hegemony, that held pride of place, does not cease to exist. It just simply drops back uh, and uh, it has to reconfigure and gives rise to something else. Protestantism is in that process right now. Many of you, and I've heard, listening to you uh, for two days, I've heard many of you protest the, the, the church. Well, you're right, absolutely, uh, and it's primarily the Protestant church you're protesting, uh, and, and, and which is kind of odd since Protestants are born as protesters, but now, you know, the, the DNA has come back to bite its mama, um, and so uh, you, you are absolutely uh, right on. Is Protestantism dead? No. Is it going to reconfigure? You bet your sweet life it's going to reconfigure. It's right now in the process of it. 500 years ago, Roman Catholicism didn't cease to exist. It did reconfigure. Orthodoxy didn't cease to exist a thousand years ago. Uh, it had to reconfigure. Um, and so we are in reconfiguration. And what we're giving rise to is emergence Christianity. And it's unfortunate that the great emergence and emergence Christianity are the same thing. The great reformation gave us Protestantism. It's easier to understand or separate the religion out from the culture. This time, because the name is shared, it's more difficult. But emergence Christianity is looking for the new answer. The Reformation said that it's scripture and scripture only. Sola scriptura, scriptura only. Give us the Bible and we're going to solve the whole thing. That's not a tenable position now for a whole lot of reasons. Um, and so we're looking for a new base of authority. Emergence Christianity will have the obligation, and so will emergence society, of finding out where that authority lives. However... There are also two or three questions that appertain to each 500-year upheaval that are peculiar to it. There are three questions that appertain to this one. One is the nature of the atonement, one is the nature of religion, or the theology of religion, and one is very serious. That is, for the first time in recorded history, we do not know what a human being is. And I just arrived at the beginning of the speech. Um, the rest was lead in. We do not know what a human being is. If you look at the last 2,000 years, 3,000 years of Western literature, or even of world literature, uh, you will find a good deal of concern with who am I and what am I. And late breaking news bulletin, it doesn't matter. Nobody cares anymore. Uh, it's not even a valid question. It's who are we. Now, there are uh, several sociological reasons or scientific reasons for that question. Uh, you can go from the middle of the 19th century when a man named Franz Mesmer came along and was the first to discover that huh, there's somebody in there and if you just watch me long enough, I'll play with you. <laughs> and we call it mesmerism and get hypnosis out of it. And then he's followed by Sigmund Freud, a student of his who came along and said, 
there is somebody in there that's so dirty, can we come play? Uh, and then it was followed, of course, by William James, and, and, and uh, so it goes, and psychology is born. More to the point in the 70s, when we hit the 60s and 70s, when we hit the drug age, what we hit is the unfortunate and completely unsettling discovery that if I give you the same amount of the same drug at the same time every day, and you had the same amount of stuff to drink and the same amount of stuff to eat and the same amount of rest, I can predictably and reproducibly change you from person A to person B. Predictably and reproducibly change you from person A to person B. By the time we got to the 1950s, it was very obvious to us, scientifically speaking, that animals are capable, capable of a form of mentation. There is something, animals come close to think, or if you've ever lived with a cat, you know damn well they think. Uh, but other, uh, other, uh, and so by the 50s, we had come to say that our identity, uh, that thing that makes us different, that is the imago dei, the image of God, is the presence of an autobiographical self. When we got to the drug age and got to A and B, we discovered that A has an autobiographical self and B has an autobiographical self. And they are consistent and have total integrity and we are not talking about some kind of organized schizophrenia. We are talking about the fact that one skin, one set of bones, one set of hair, whatever, uh, actually can incorporate two uh, distinct con consciousnesses. And that leads fairly quickly to the question of what is a human being? What is a human being? What is the nature of consciousness? Are we just a something that a, a chemical wash over our neurological systems? Uh, what is the nature of the soul? And one of the interesting things that comes up out of this, and it comes up out of the great emergence and emergence Christianity is, we no longer know what a soul is. Nobody in this room can define a soul. Um, I did a couple of clergy conferences about 10 years ago just to see if it was right and uh, handed out index cards to 150 clergy each time and said, just put the year of your birth on here, not your, not your name, and finish the sentence, the soul is. I only did it twice because both times over half of the cards came back empty. Mm -hmm. And about a tenth of them came back with the seminary gobbledygook that they teach you. And the rest were just blabbering idiots. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and, and couldn't believe they didn't know and just didn't know it, so they hit it by talking too much. Um, and, and I found it so distressing, I only did it the two times. I would submit to you that we are here to talk about what the soul is. I would submit to you that people like you probably are nearer uh, to being able to have that conversation than is a good deal of organized religion, except I want to talk about one more thing. Uh, there's a man named Harvey Cox. Uh, he's perhaps the most respected religionist in this country. He's emeritus Harvard now. Uh, and Harvey published a book in November called The Future of Faith. I call it to your attention. Um, and he talks about Joachim of Fjorni. I wrote a book some three or four years ago called The Great Emergence, in which I tried to talk about Joachim of Fjorni too. And my editor said, it's too woo-woo, you have to take it out. Uh, and I said, it's too essential to go out. And he said, take it out. So I didn't put it in a footnote because editors never read footnotes, and so it's there tucked away. Um, Harvey, uh, on the other hand, gives you six pages of Joachim of Fjorni. And this is, Joachim of Fjorne was perhaps the most the, the, the verbal, articulate, uh, aggressive, if you will, uh, of the medieval mystics. Uh, and he was the mouthpiece, if you will, for a whole company of medieval mystics in the 12th and 13th century. Uh, and Joachim and the company of mystics taught that there would be 7,000 years to human dispensation. And being Christian, they argued that the first 2,000 years would be the 2,000 years of God the Father, and they would go from the Garden of Eden to the cross. The second 2,000 years, said Joachim, would go, would be the, the 2,000 years of God the Son, and they would begin with the cross and the great transformation, and they would end in 2,000 of what he called Anno Domini. Uh, and then the third dispensation would be the dispensation of God the Spirit, and it would, it would commence in 2000 Anno Domini and go to 4000 Anno Domini. 
He did not, neither did his fellow mystics, say anything about the last thousand years because Tim LaHaye and, and Jerry Jenkins hadn't been born yet, and so they didn't know what to do with that thousand years. But nonetheless, he predicted that. The Roman church excommunicated posthumously, excommunicated Joachim. He predicted some other things that were wrong, and they took it as an excuse to get rid of this heresy. Uh, very quietly, just before he died, John Paul II unexcommunicated uh, Joachim of Hjorni. Equally quietly, in uh, the first three months of his tenure uh, as, as Pope, Benedict uh, XVI opened an office of Joachim Studies in the Vatican, and it continues to function. And they are investigating the words of the mystics and the medieval prophets, trying to see exactly what Harvey Cox in November gave academic face to. Because what Cox argues, and he cites Joachim, what he argues is that for the first 300 years of Christianity, we ran on, on first-hand information. We knew somebody who knew Jesus, or we knew somebody who had known Jesus, or we knew somebody who had known somebody who had known somebody who had known Jesus, yada, yada. That only lasts for about 300 years. And after that, we tried to begin to dogmatize and doctrinalize and organize and intellectualize everything that it had been about. And whatever else Judeo-Christian tradition is, it is as mystical as anybody sitting in this room. Uh, you cannot outdo the mysticism inherent in the Judeo-Christian story. But it's very upsetting. As some of you may have discovered, it's very upsetting to be in woo-woo land. It's very upsetting to talk about the dead. It's really uncomfortable to have a drink with them after they're completely dead, you know? Um, and, and then to go tell your friends that you've done it is equally upsetting. Um, and it will also get you isolated. So, uh, for 1,700 years, we tried to organize the thing. Uh, and then says Cox, Joachim is right. We've now come, we've now come to, the, to, the, to the age of the Spirit. We're through with the emphasis on God the Father and through with the emphasis on God the Son. Now we want a full trinity. And now we're going into the last 2,000 years, which will be the age of God the Spirit. And he argues, as does every other scholar I know, that in 1907, 1906, when in Azusa Street in Los Angeles, there was the coming of the, what's called the Azusa Street Experience and the birth of Pentecostalism. It's the beginning of the age of the Spirit. All of which is a long way around for saying two things, or maybe three. The first of them is that in 1955, when I had my near-death experience, you couldn't talk about it because nobody knew what you were talking about. You could talk to your cows came home, and it didn't matter. There were none, uh, or if so, they, they were so poorly reported that there was no general. The notion that six or seven of us, much less this many of us, could come together with a common experience just wasn't there. There are two reasons for that, I think. First of all, we resuscitate better now. We have better medicine, uh, and we have better records. There's no question about that. And also the receptivity that allows it to be heard. If you look at classical literature, and we were talking about this at breakfast, I think there are only three records in Roman literature, anyway, the best I remember, of near-death experiences. Um, and they were so rare that they were written down as rarities and what the world was this about. Um, and, but by the time you get to our time, by the time you get to the age of the spirit, by the time you get to uh, uh, Christianity open to, and, and Islam and uh, Judaism too, open to the Pentecostal experience. But now you're getting into the popular experience. Which is a way, I think, of saying that what you and I have gone through and what we know is in many ways a kind of rare bank, if you will, of inform information, experiential information, uh, in which a science is soon going to connect with uh, religion, is going to connect with the experiential, is going to connect with the fact that indeed we're once more as mystical as were our forebears. If you know anything at all about the Old Testament, and I hope you do, uh, and certainly about the New Testament, uh, there is near death after near death, and there is resuscitation after resuscitation and resurrection. Uh, the first resurrection, of course, is the witch of Endor, uh, who very kindly managed to conjure uh, the, the ghost of the dead Samuel for King Saul, and they had an interesting conversation uh, in which uh, the conjured Samuel said, you're going to die in the morning, big boy. 
uh, and Saul said, I know, I, I felt that. And uh, so the witch puts Samuel back down where he was, uh, wherever that was, um, and Saul goes out and gets killed the next morning. Um, and, and so time after time, uh, we have scriptural reference to the dead speaking, uh, to those coming back from the dead uh, with a message. So I would submit to you that what you've got here uh, is uh, probably a, a disorganized bank of information, uh, but that doesn't mean that it can't be organized and separated into categories, and I suspect it truly is a rich, rich bank of data. Now, for the personal story um, and, and how I got there, I was telling Diane, I hadn't thought about it in years, in the early 50s there was a man named J.B. Ryan uh, at Duke University, and he was the first to deal with the paranormal, uh, and he did what was called ESP, it's almost an antique term now, uh, extrasensory perception. Uh, and uh, he had a number of doctoral students whom he desired to send out into the field. And one of them was a man named Hornaday, Joe Hornaday. And Joe Hornaday came to the college where I was an undergraduate. He came the same year I came as a freshman. And he was full of sass and vinegar, and uh, very interested in proving that exactly what was happening at Duke uh, in the ESP, in ESP uh, uh, work was absolutely there and could be studied scientifically. And so he sort of uh, screened, if you will, uh, the freshman class to see if any of us were in any way intuitive or psychic. Uh, and I got picked. Um, and uh, there were five of us. I think only three of us survived. And the deal was, every Saturday morning, you went up to the third floor of a classroom building, which had absolutely nobody in it. Uh, and Dr. Hornaday would put one person down at one end of the, of the hallway in a classroom, and the other person way down at the other end. And we would see if you could send messages back and forth. Um, and it turned out, no surprise, that I was a great projector and a lousy receiver. Uh, and so I would project all Saturday morning. Um, we were dealing with basically uh, with cards, game cards, and uh, you would project five at a time. I'm looking at the Ace of Spades, I'm looking at the Queen of Hearts, I'm looking at, and uh, the scientific study was whether the person, in, in my case it was always a girlfriend, down at the other end of the hall could correctly record in order what it was you were projecting. Uh, and my first experience with the psychic was to realize that I could do that with something like 90% accuracy given the right receptor at the other end. Uh, which uh, says, of course, that you're doing something electrical, right? Uh, or something spiritual. I suspect it's an electrical thing. But that was my first experience with it. Uh, then as a bride, married in 1955 in June, I ended up pregnant in October of 55. Uh, no surprise there, that was before the birth control pill. Sam and I, even after the birth control pill, have managed to have seven children uh, in 55 years of marriage, and uh, so obviously, uh, you know, I was, I was slated to do that. I managed to get pregnant, and I managed to not know I was pregnant until I passed out in a grocery store, uh, and got, of course, uh, yanked to the doctor's office, and the pregnancy was discovered, and uh, then I started trying to miscarry, which would be part of my life for the rest of my reproductive years. I, if we have seven children, we must have lost two for every one we got <clears throat> to term with, um, which is an emotional yo-yo of the first water, uh, especially, I think, for the mother. But anyway, um, and to try to prevent that first term or the first pregnancy from miscarrying, I was given a drug called Papaverin, the best I remember, Papaverin, I think it was. Uh, it was found out later that it was fatal and had already killed nine women, but um, at that point nobody knew that. And it was experimental and we were in desperate straits and you didn't want somebody to lose the first child and so I got it. Um, and woke up uh, it, 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 one evening about 12 o'clock with Sam slapping me, uh, and he was a med student at that point, slapping me and screaming at the top of his lungs. He was screaming to, we had a couple of dental students as roommates across the hall and uh, he was screaming for help, and uh, then before it was over, he actually was uh, about to break my ribs, uh, and I thought, isn't this kind of interesting, but I was certainly conscious, and the ambulance came, and uh, he beat me all the way down the steps uh, into the ambulance, and we made it to the hospital, and things uh, calmed down for a day, but they continued to give me the drug, not knowing what it, that there was any harm to it. Um, and then there came that moment on the afternoon of the second day, which will be familiar to you all already before I even tell the tape, that
they ca there came that moment uh, when he was sitting by my bed, and um, I simply uh, left uh, and went up and sat in the upper corner uh, of, of the hospital room uh, like a gargoyle, uh, like <laughs> in that position with my back pressed into the corner uh, where the ceiling met the wall, and watched him and thought, you know, he really is kind of cute. Um, but, uh, uh, and then watched as he began to scream again uh, and to slap my body, at which time I looked down and saw him slapping me and thinking, isn't it odd, I don't even feel it, and he was screaming and the nurses came, um, two of them, and uh, I can, uh, could tell you uh, exactly what they had on and who it was and watched the whole thing. And then I remember getting kind of bored by the whole thing and the ceiling very conveniently opened up, the corner did. And I just went out into this lovely green tunnel, which was grass all the way around. It was before AstroTurf was invented, so it had to be divine because there was no other way to get grass on the ceiling. But um, <laughs> it was uh, quite lovely. Uh, and uh, it was a, a, a tunnel of, I don't know, the, the length didn't, but it, I, I walked for a little while. I could see the light, the, the gorgeous light uh, at the end of the tunnel. Uh, and got almost to the end, uh, and uh, the, the voice uh, who was speaking to me in, in, uh, in a way I understood, though I can't honestly say it was words as such. It was a male voice, which I find is interesting. Um, and consistently, I think that's pretty true. Uh, it was a, a male voice, and, and sort of the message was, uh, do you want to come? Uh, and I found myself answering back, no, I don't think so. I think I want to go back and have his babies. Uh, and being then told, all right, do that, and it will be fine, I will be waiting. Um, and so I came back, uh, and um, indeed I was back in that body, and have several times thought maybe I made a wrong mistake, I should have taken it while I could get it. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, it, it was uh, a classic out-of-body, followed by a classic near-death. The problem was in 55, they very quickly discovered, they did research on the drug and very quickly discovered that that was what was killing me, withdrew the drug, um, and I was in hospital for another five or six days and then went home to four months of not being able to walk. Uh, it had blown out all the proprioception. And uh, so we had four tough months uh, when a husband in med school also had a wife who needed full-time care. I don't know how he did it, but he did. Um, anyway, and I came back and lived to teach uh, Latin to poor high school students for another six months uh, before it was over. They wish I had left also, but anyway, <laughs> uh, however that may be. Uh, the, uh, because Sam was in med school, uh, and because it was 55, and because uh, especially in Western culture, things of the spirit were not looked at with any kind of appreciation. Um, even the Holy Spirit was kind of iffy in Western Christianity. We simply could not talk about what had happened. Uh, it so threatened his understanding of basic medical science that it became the only thing, I think, that we could absolutely not talk about. And it's only been in about the last 20 years that uh, he has allowed that conversation to happen. Uh, it was a threat in every way, uh, and it made no sense. And I was absolutely sure it had happened. And as Diane read earlier, um, and as all of you know, once it's happened, you're just not afraid of death again. Um, much of the old uh, weaponry that organized Christianity and Judaism to some extent, but certainly Christianity uses to beat you around the head and neck about uh, the hereafter and the individual salvation and uh, all of that stuff, just becomes so much blowing in the wind uh, because it just doesn't hold up. And experiential truth, um, will trump uh, academic or acquired truth every time. And so um, we lived with uh, the tension of my having been dramatically changed um, and uh, his not having had that change. And the fact that I could tell him everything that had happened uh, didn't make any difference at all. It just was not subject to reason. And so uh, we didn't talk about it. Uh, and then uh, some years later, uh, it so happened that uh, we bought a house. We bought a house and, and, and we were residents at that time, and residents don't have much more money than med students. 
Well, we, we bought a house that was the most run-down, awful thing I've ever seen, but it was right near the hospital. It was in a very good neighborhood, and it had absolutely been abused to death. And we bought it for the grand sum of $14,500 in what was really a Chi-Chi area of Memphis, Tennessee, in Central Gardens. And you couldn't have bought a head coat for $14,500, which should have told me that something was going on. Uh, and so after the papers were signed, I was just so grateful. We had three kids at that time. I had to have a place to park them. Uh, and only one car, so we had to be at the hospital. I said to the woman who sold it to us, um, would you tell me why we got this house for fourteen five? And she said, um, oh, well, uh, Lawrence will tell you that. Uh, and I said, who is Lawrence? <laughs> and she said, Lawrence was my husband. He died in that upstairs bedroom, uh, and, um, and he has never left. And um, <laughs> he, uh, he really did want a family with children in there, and he told me uh, the night you made the, uh, the offer that I was to sell to you regardless of whatever you had in the way of money. So I sold it to you. I said, all right. <laughs> okay, I can believe Lawrence told you that. I just don't want him living in my upstairs bedroom. But anyway, uh, we moved in, and I kind of forgot about Lawrence. And uh, about six weeks into the house, uh, my, at that point, nine-year-old daughter uh, just came out all fury like this one morning. And she said, Mother, if you don't do something with Lawrence, I'm going to fail fourth grade. <laughs> and she said, he just comes in every night and sits in my rocking chair and he rocks and it annoys me and then last night he came and he pulled the, the covers off my feet because I wouldn't get up and play with him. I said, you're kidding. Now here are two younger sisters sitting around saying, yeah, he annoys us too, but he likes her better. Um, <laughs> Sam doesn't want to hear this either. <laughs> really? <laughs> so the girls and I, we had three girls first. Then we had three boys. And I told Diane, as we went into the delivery room with the seventh, the seventh child, this was before sonograms, I swear it's true, he swears it's not true. With his hand on the door, he said, so help me God, if it's another boy, I'm not coming back for either one of you. Um, which was you know, his, his take on having three sons in a row. But the girls and I kind of stepped around once. We had some interesting experiences. I went running up the back stairs one day uh, and saw him and knew I had done it. And my oldest daughter said, ah! what I had done was I ran right through him. He was standing at the top of, uh, of the steps. And I just didn't see him in time and went right through. Uh, and they were destroyed that I had done this. Do you think this is too woo-woo? This is true. I will swear this on small Yeah. Okay. It's absolutely true. So anyway, uh, we, we walked around Lawrence, and I came to value and treasure him. Um, uh, he, he was a good friend in, in many ways. And the time came to sell that house and move to the country. Uh, Sam's practice had grown, and we didn't have to be right at the hospital anymore, and it was time to teach our children how to live on the land. Um, and so uh, we uh, got ready to sell the house. Some uh, three years before we sold it, we had redecorated with an eye to making it a bit more attractive, and we had the money to do it then. And we had in uh, the old dining room the most god-awful chandelier ever I have seen. Uh, and we uh, cut it down, and by that time we had two little boys too. And the, the youngest boy said, you can't do that, that's where Lawrence sleeps. Uh, <laughs> so we couldn't throw away the god-awful chandelier, and we took it upstairs and put it in the attic. And uh, were assured by the children that Lawrence slept quite happily up in the attic in the chandelier, uh, and everything was fine. So we signed the contract to sell the house in Central Gardens, which now look Pretty good. I mean, it was it was back up to neighborhood standard. And we got ready. We sold the house. We signed the papers. And uh, the night after we had signed the papers, um, there was the most unholy racket in the upstairs hall I have ever heard. We had in the bathroom that faced that hall a built-in clothes hamper. It was really very handsome. We'd spent some money to get it in there. 
Uh, and when I went out of my dining, uh, out of my bedroom door, to have children converging from their bedroom doors, there in the middle of the hall was the clothes hamper ripped out of the wall, and all of the dirty clothes spread everywhere. And the the wall in the in the in the bathroom had been ripped. Uh, cost us some money to fix it, by the way, which also aggravated Sam. But <laughs> and there we stand. And Sam, at this point, cannot avoid the fact that somebody just ripped his new carpentry out and spread. Uh, and so, uh, before he can say anything that is quotable right now, uh, his number two daughter said, Told you so, Daddy. It's Lawrence. He's pissed as hell. Quote, end quote. Uh, and uh, the father answered with equal uh, language. Uh, and just as we were having this scatological conversation, Downstairs, there was an unholy racket in the kitchen. Uh, and when we went down, everything had been swiped off the front of the refrigerator. It was the, you know, like in all households, it was the posting, it was the bulletin board. Everything was down. The refrigerator door had been opened and all of the food thrown into the carpet, uh, all over the kitchen. And then she said, said Miss Mary to her father, do you believe me now? And in that moment, he said, yes. And the conversation changed because there was no, there was no way to avoid um, the, the obvious um, uh, that indeed we had annoyed Lawrence. He didn't want us, and so he said to our son, uh, "Can you persuade him to move with us?" Which was an amazing uh, turn. <laughs> Can you persuade him to move with us? Uh, and John said, uh, "Maybe." Well, we had a realtor, a, a charming woman. And uh, she had sealed the deal, and uh, she came to tell us goodbye, and we did indeed move to the country. And when we got to the country, one of the first things that the children said was, Lawrence didn't come. Uh, there's something wrong. Uh, and so John said, I know what's wrong. We didn't bring his chandelier, and he won't come without his chandelier. So we went back to the still empty house and trucked up to the attic. No chandelier. Well, um, so uh, I said, okay, uh, are you sure? And the real estate agent said, I'm absolutely sure it was here when I made my last check. I have to make a last check and sign off before we turn over the keys. And that chandelier was here. No chandelier. House had been totally empty. Nobody would steal this thing. You couldn't pay somebody to haul it off. It was really ugly, okay? And, you know, it wasn't like somebody paid for the thing. It's an ugly chandelier. <laughs> So uh, the boys were still little enough to weep, and they wept about no chandelier and no Lawrence because they were accustomed to playing with him at night when they couldn't sleep. And we went on for about uh, four weeks when our real estate agent, Betty called, Betty Baker, called and said, you have to do something about your ghost. And I said, what? And she said, uh, he's really is angry, isn't he? And I said, yeah, I think he's pretty angry. And she said, well, he's with us. And he's turning on at 4 o'clock in the morning every television and light on the house. <laughs> and my husband's going to divorce me if we can't get rid of him. Uh, and says, and, and Sam to this day says, I think she took the chandelier and she deserves it. But um, <laughs> <laughs> so ugly, I might have played it. Uh, but, uh, uh, and it went, on, uh, it went on at her house for a couple of weeks before finally weeping. She said, you have really got to do something. I can't, uh, I can't go on like this. Uh, and so I said, just tell him we wish he'd come home, uh, and we're sorry, and we think this is where we belong. Um, and the, the problems at her house quit, and within a week, uh, number three daughter came in radiantly smiling to the kitchen in the country and said, Lawrence is out in the orchard, I just saw him. Uh, and, uh, so, uh, and, and Lawrence has lived with us since, um, and has been uh, a, a wonderful friend, I think he's protected us in many ways. You can park it wherever you want to. Uh, he's also done us a good deed uh, a time or two. We had an unfortunate son-in-law um, who we uh, all thought was weird sort of choice, but that was okay if that's what she wanted. And uh, she wasn't too happy either, and they were staying with us for a few days. And uh, she had uh, not mentioned Florence, and she went to town, and the house was empty. <laughs> she went to town to get some groceries and uh, came home to find her soon-to-be ex, though she didn't know it when she entered the house, um, with wet pants locked up in uh, the washroom with the doors locked, sucking his thumb literally and screaming. 
And uh, she went down and finally family followed the noise and there he was. And she said, what? And he said, you didn't tell me about that. Uh, and uh, that was the end of that sign on. Uh, didn't tell me about that. Uh, but Lawrence has done us a, a few good deeds. One of the, uh, when I, I was very fond of my mother-in-law, I know that is counter to tradition, but she was a, a great lady. Um, good old mountain stop, Appalachian, tough as they come, um, and uh, wonderful to me. And when she died, um, she stayed with me for three days, uh, posthumously, and uh, we had some good conversations. And uh, then one day, and uh, I was making the bed on the third day, and she said, it's time now, I've got to go. Um, and I haven't seen her since. But uh, the, uh, I think maybe uh, some of the paranormal is contagious in a way, uh, because one of the things that has relieved the conversation at our household and has allowed it to uh, continue or to go forward is that um, shortly uh, before his mother's death, uh, my husband is pulmonology, uh, and pulmonology is a scary uh, subspecialty of medicine. It's very hard to deal day in and day out with people who are drowning in their own juice, who can't breathe, and who really are essentially drowning. And it's an emotionally exhausting thing. And you have them in pulmonology, some of them for 20 years, uh, of watching them unable to breathe as it gets worse and worse. And all you're going to do is palliation. You're not going to cure it. So there's a deep uh, emotional uh, attachment, uh, if you will, uh, between a good pulmonologist and, and his patients in a way that does not accrue in most other medical specialties. Uh, and um, Sam was out, that was his day off, and Sam was out in, in the cornfield. We really did take the kids to the country because we wanted them to live off the land. Um, and uh, he had, was out hoeing the corn, and uh, he came in, it was August, he, he came in uh, to where I was, white as a sheep, uh, and I said, what? And he said, uh, James, James Bell. And I said, what? And he said, James just came to me in the field, he's dead. And I said, oh, I'm sorry, because he's very fond of this guy. And I said, are you sure? And he said, I'm sure, he's dead. And he, he just said, Doc, I wanted to tell you goodbye. Um, and so, um, and, and you know, Sam wept. Um, and within five minutes, the phone rang, and it was the hospital mm -hmm. saying, uh, that James Bell had just come in a DOA and would Dr. Tickle sign a death certificate without their having to do a post based on the medical history. And Dr. Tickle said, yes, I will, and went into the hospital and declared James dead. Um, but uh, after that experience, the conversation has been a little easier. Now, <laughs> where you want to park all of that, I don't know. Uh, I, uh, MJ's heard me a thousand times. I bet she's never heard these tales. Uh, no, she says, uh, they won't go out of this room, right? <laughs> Even as they're video. Uh, Bill asked me when we were uh, back before the meeting started, uh, how do you get away with essentially he didn't put it quite this way. I had to get it away from being weird and also acceptable in the, world, in the wider world. Uh, and, and, and the question is, uh, I, I think that, um, I, I honestly think that those of us who have had these experiences have an obligation to begin cleaning up our act. Uh, and maybe this is not a fair thing to say and there's no judgment in, inherent in it. And I did come to learn and to hear and I have been pleased to do that for 24 hours. And Diane has been a wonderful source of uh, books, and she's given me more than I can read for the next year and a half uh, and DVDs. Uh, but uh, there can be a self-indulgence uh, in this kind of experience. There can be, uh, because we have had it, and because people who have not had it don't really understand, a tendency to just enjoy having had it. Um, and uh, to sort of celebrate your own oddity, if you will, uh, or to confuse the paranormal uh, with resuscitatory, uh, with near death, uh, to make them all into one kind of, I don't know, ambrosia, if you will, uh, in, instead of particularized fruits. If we're ever, uh, and, and there is no question that emergence Christianity is having to deal with what is a human being and what is a soul. And we have more of the raw material, I suspect, 
than any other segment of society for beginning to answer that question. And if that be true, then there is, I think, patent in that privilege of having had those experiences, the obligation to begin to talk about them and to begin to talk with some sense of purpose uh, and to understand how indeed our religious heritage, almost everybody in this room comes out of something that's Abrahamic, I suspect, uh, and certainly in Buddhism it's there. Uh, there. There is the whisper of this. There is every evidence that this is perfectly normal, that this has been the human experience from the get-go. And it's only our unwillingness to grapple with what it is because what we're doing is grappling with God. Uh, and when you grapple with God, uh, you're going to get you're going to get your hip thrown out of joint. <laughs> there's a good, there's a good, good record for that too, uh, you know. And your name's going to get changed. Um, but the time to begin to talk more generally uh, about it, I think, is upon us, because there is no question that as whatever else happens in the next 50 years, it will be uh, science, religion. Just plain folks, everybody, <coughs> struggling to answer that question. What is a human being? And we cannot decide in the life issues. We cannot decide bioengineering issues. We cannot decide abortion issues. We cannot decide any of those things uh, until we can answer the question, <coughs> what is a human being? And part of the answer, a good part of the answer, is buried in the mysticism that religion has tried to formalize and that for some reason, uh, Harvey Cox is right, has burst out in the last 50 years, which is why so many of us can sit in this room and talk about this. So I would suggest that you're sitting on top of, we are sitting on top of, one of the great natural resources for the next 50 years. And that that is both a privilege and an obligation. Uh, and and uh, the obligation is upon us, uh, not only to tell our stories, but to try to begin to sort out the categories within those stories, where they fit, uh, where they have their analogs, what they mean, uh, and what it is that we are. Because uh, we cannot decide as citizens the polity and secular answers to end the block, to biology, to any of that, until we have uh, the answers spiritual uh, about what it is. And we are, as the talk says, we're entering the 2,000 years of the age of the spirit. And so, God bless. Would I be able to uh, uh, share what the Spirit has revealed to me about the future? Uh, I, I would if there, um, I, I'm not prophetically. I, um, obviously I deal as a sociologist of religion, I deal in predictive factors, but those are intellectual and they're based on footnotes and, and, and they're based on scholarship, which is not, I think, what you're asking about. Um, I don't have uh, prophetic gifts. Uh, in, in any way. I can tell you with amazing accuracy what's going to happen over the next five years or so far. If it's within that field where, where the scholarship is there and you can, you can, I, I did much of my 12 years at Publishers Weekly was learning to say, now the next one that's going to hit the market is this, so begin to acquire manuscripts here, uh, which is predictive, it's applied predictiveness, but it's an intellectual exercise uh, and it's not a spiritual one. Yes? By your 500-year uh, model yes. of uh, these radical changes in monotheism, do you think, uh, by your reckoning, Islam is due for a reformation? Um, the question is, given the 500-year cycle, and, and I should uh, I should give due credit for that. Um, the uh, the cycle is certainly not of my invention. It was um, the earliest I have seen it actually written out is in, in, in a, 1970. I think is the first I, I've seen it actually uh, written out in in our era. Um, and uh, we Episcopalians have a bishop, Mark Dyer, who when he gets ready to lecture on it and, and he tries to domesticate it this way, 
Um, he says that what you have to understand is that about every 500 years, the church feels compelled to have a, a giant rummage sale, and we're having one. Um, and, and that kind of uh, eases it a little bit. But it's not just the church. It's, it is indeed, uh, you use the word Western, and that, that's a, a, a good way to say it. it is that part of the world. It's very specific. It is that part of the world that guts Christianity through the Latin language, as opposed to Syriac and Greek. So that uh, Emergence, for instance, shows up in South Africa fairly early. Uh, because it's been colonialized by, uh, so that it, it's a very particular part of the world. And the interesting thing is that Islam, you don't think of as belonging um, uh, to that part of the world, except it does. It has its origin in a resistance to the patent polytheism or the assumed polytheism of Christianity. If you really look at the beginning of Islam, it's an attempt to reestablish uh, re monotheism in Eastern Mediterranean culture because Christianity was seen as polytheistic with the Trinity kind of thing. And, and so uh, Islam uh, has gone through the same cycle. If, if I were in systems theory, and it's one of those, it, if I had liked to do over again, I'd do two or three things different, not many of them. But one of them is I'd take at least two, maybe a college degree um, in, in basic physics uh, so I could go out and do things. Systems theory, uh, has all kinds of explanations for why the 500 years is there. Uh, they have all kinds of explanations for why every cycle is there. I, I'm not informed enough or bright enough. I just have them stand up in audiences and say, there's a reason for that. And I'll say, systems theorists, and they'll say yes, and I'll say, down boy, because, you know, you've lost the whole lecture from then on. He's going to tell me why um, and, and tell everybody else there. Um, so there, there is some reason for the 500-year cycle. But um, apparently, either it's in the culture, in that landmass, or it's in the Abrahamic faiths. And I, I'm blessed if I can figure out why. And I don't know enough about Islamic history. I ought to stop and do it. I just haven't had time to know why the imams rise up to a point. I do know that uh, what they tell me is that, uh, because it's 650 years out of sync, that, uh, and... Every time we go through one of the 150 years, there's about a 150-year tick up to it. It's called the Perry Emergence or the Perry Reformation or the Perryism, in which whatever had been the authority is chipped at and, and knocked down. And then you arrive at that moment of crisis when suddenly you realize it's no good. You know, Sola Scriptura is dead. Oh my God, what am I going to do? Kind of thing. Um, and and if you if you look at it from that point of view, Islamist scholars uh, say that Islam is now entering the Perry what would be an analogous to our Perry Reformation. That is, that it is now about to begin the 150, or it's already begun, the 150-year tick-up to their Reformation. Uh, now, whether that's whistling in the wind, or, uh, see, that's the kind of prophetic thing that you can do academically. Um, whether that holds water or not, I don't know. I do know that in this culture, because I come out of the book business, 35 years in the book business, um, I do know that in this culture there are three uh, highly respected Islamic publishers. Uh, and each one of them, for the last two or three years, has had at least two or three books on, uh, its, on each house's forthcoming list dealing with Reformation in Islam. So there is a, and there's a circulation now of, of that material. Every time we have gone through one of these things also, um, since the founding of Islam, there has been the initial clash with Islam. Uh, and and uh, so more than one scholar has said 9-11 was inevitable and didn't really have anything to do with anything. You know, I mean, it just it had to do with that, that conflict. Uh, and the Great Emergence is now, in the same way that you say the Great Reformation began in October 31st, 1517, when Luther put 95 on the door of Wittenberg. Well, that's bull, and we all know it. I mean, it, it, it didn't any more happen right then than you turned into a grown-up on the morning of your 21st birthday. All that happened was you got legal to drink. I mean that you know, but there was a lead up to it. In the same way, uh, there was a lead up to this one. So when we say that 9/11 um, is the date that history is probably going to say the great emergence is upon us, uh, we've got 150 years uh, of tick up to it in, in the same way. So that uh, who knows what will happen with Islam? But it it, it puts an interesting face. It puts a kinder face, maybe a more acceptable face, or a, uh, a more human face, uh, if they too are, are living through a, a kind of cycle thing. Uh, it makes it less harsh. I, I don't know what I'm trying to say. It, uh, it, uh, more forgivable in some way or more... Um, uh, it, it, it is softened my emotional reaction to 9-11.
Did you have any sense of Islam before 9-11, or did it take 9-11? Did I have any sense of Islam before 9-11? Yes, I did, but that's, uh, that's aberrant. Uh, it's, it's because um, from the time religion began to hit uh, secular publishing in 91 and 92 in this country, there was uh, a minor but very able uh, Islamic uh, publishing presence. And so I came into the work at Publishers Weekly in nine, at the beginning of 92 with absolutely no knowledge of Islam beyond what they teach you at school, you know. Uh, uh, not really, and then had to uh, uh, both inform myself and fortunately be informed by uh, some of my colleagues who were in Islamic publishing and who were very, very kind uh, in, in instructing me. But no, I had no, uh, no first. I've never been in a mosque except on Second Life where my avatar goes every once in a while just because it's, it's perverse to be able to go as a woman into a mosque, you know. Uh, and Second Life's perverse too. Yeah. I'd like to know, would you kindly spell the name of your team? I think it's J-O-Y-C-H-I-M. What is the last name? I could not understand it. Joachim. Joachim of Fiorne. Uh, it, it, it is J-O-A-C-H-I-M. Joachim of Fiorne. F-I-O-R-N-E. F-I-O-R-N-E. Italian. Okay. Yeah. L I look him up. Uh, and Joachim studies now. It's, uh, you know, give him a Google. Yeah, I have a question. I mean, I, I appreciate you and your scholarly, um, you know, knowledge. I, or whatever. But, um, a recovering academic never gets over it. You know, it just <laughs> sounds like a lecture, regardless of One what I did. Right? <laughs> but I'm impressed. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, the, the, in your in your knowledge and in your studies, I mean, uh, there there are a lot of um, Christian mystics. Yes, there are. That that have written have, have been written about and mm -hmm. have written literature, and, and also this whole subject of uh, the whole religion of Rust, I can't pronounce, Rust, Rust, um, Rustarian? Or? Oh, uh, um, no, no. Um, yeah, uh, no, no, uh, it started, um, yeah, sure. well, we, yes, you know. Yeah, I know what you're talking about, I just can't say it, right? I can't say it, yeah, Rust, 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 yeah, you're close. Close, close yeah. but it's not, not, it's not yeah. But, but yeah. in all of this, um, there's a great body of knowledge around something that's intangible, but yet. Uh, sure. And uh, out of all this body of work, is there anything that speaks to you more pronounced or, or more than, than one or the other? Is there something? You uh, the question is out of, uh, and there has been, if you look even at the history of religion in the United States for the last 150 years, or look at the 19th century, it will fascinate you how many uh, religious groups sprang up. And they're all, they're all pushing toward Azusa Street. They're all pushing toward, uh, you know, Seventh-day Adventist, uh, the, um, Christian science, theosophy, unity, um, thing after thing, where there's this pushing, it's the preparation for the Pentecostal experience, for the coming fully. I mean, uh, and Cox argues that. Does any one of those appeal to me? The question is, does any one of those uh, appeal to me more than any of the other? When I say the book of Urantia, do I say anything to you? Um, I, I don't know if it appeals to me. I find it worth looking at. Uh, Simply because, and I, I'm sure it would be heretical uh, or, or near heretical, um, but there there is an interesting um, and Helen White, out of uh, uh, she she's almost a biblical fundamentalist, uh, looked at it from a spiritual point of view, uh, and Helen White, who was the establishment uh, established Seventh Day Adventist, uh, and uh, her writings are are very interesting uh, to me, very appealing. Maybe Helen White appeals more. Uh, Urantia interests me. There's a difference, isn't there? Uh, you're asking for appeal. I think Helen White, uh, probably. Uh, and if I had been born 150 years sooner, uh, I, I might have, you know, ended up uh, uh, listening to her. There is in the Ju Judy Judeo-Christian uh, heritage so much mysticism. So much mysticism. Uh, and one of the things that emergence uh, you know, Christians, as I speak to them around the country, one of the things they want is they'll say, don't you tell me that it's two stories in one set of covers. It's one story in one set of covers. And don't you talk to me, for instance, about the virgin birth. Don't you talk to me about the virgin birth unless you're willing to go back to the Valley of Shabbos and the Melchizedek. 
and talk to me about the priest of Salem who met Abram on the plains and who had neither progeny nor progenitor and out of whose tradition. You know, so we've got from the get-go uh, this very mystical character uh, who had no parentage. He just appears uh, and begins the Hebrew story. So from the very beginning, unless you count a talking snake, uh, you know, then you've got this thing. Yeah. Yes, sir. I was raised in the Jewish tradition, and okay. very, very few Jews actually study mysticism. That's right. Because there's an Orthodox tradition that it can make you crazy, and the don't, Zohar will lead you don't straight even to attempt to study until you're 40 years old. And there's there's a lot of push not to study it, which I think dovetails perfectly into what we've been talking about today, that the 500 years and the 500 years and the 500 years, so I yeah. understand it better now. Yeah, it, it, it does dovetail, and when you get a really ecstatic, ecstatic rabbi talking about it, it's just really wonderful. And they will look at the Kabbalah, and they will look at the Zohar and say, you know, here were precursors. Here was the, you know, the fact that, and uh, the Zohar is now back in business, as I'm sure you know. Uh, you know, it's being dusted off and put on the center shelf. And you're right, you just didn't do that. Because I come from mixed heritage, I know a little bit, you know. Um, you just didn't fool with that. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, can you express your opinion about December 2012? I'm sorry, can I express my opinion about oh, 2012? Um, my, my opinion about 2012 is I don't see any reason to, uh, I mean, uh, yes, there were ancient prophecies about that. <coughs> I, I, it, it was like the turn of the millennium uh, in 1999. Uh, it, it was hard to really give much credibility uh, to, uh, to all that millennium fever, but it was fun to enjoy it, uh, as long as there's no anxiety. Uh, and I'm not sure this one's going to be fun to, to, uh, to watch. I don't, um, I don't have any sense of credibility to that uh, or any anxiety about it. That may be my ignorance, and in 2013 we may all reassemble and say, obviously you didn't know what you were talking about. But at a personal level, uh, to, uh, to 2012, no. I greatly respect uh, some of the indigenous uh, prophecies from South, from South America, from Guatemala, from that area. Um, but no, I don't, I don't, I don't hear anything uh, that persuades me. Yes. Um, in my work with people, I have found over the last 30 years an enormous and increasingly enormous dissatisfaction with established religion. Presbyterianism, Methodist, Catholicism. That's right. And what comes behind this, what I have found through some of my readings, that one of the things that Joseph Campbell said is what people are really looking for is the experience of really being alive. It's not so much the meaning but the experience. From your perspective and your history, are you finding some of the established <coughs> religions now trying to move towards helping people have a direct experience with God? Not in the head. What we're talking about no, is car. what to be intellectualized. But is any of that happening? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I don't know whether you can hear him or not, but um, the, one of, the, the great emergence really uh, the great emergence affects every part uh, of our lives. Um, and and it's, it's from simple things like the fact that, um, well, for goodness sakes, when you go home at night, you're so tired of knowing stuff that you don't want to know another thing. Remember that, you know, at 5.30, the last thing you want is another fact. You've just been facted to death, uh, you know. And, and, and so if you're Episcopalian, anyway, what you do is you hit the front door and you're heading straight for the kitchen to have a conversation with Jack. Um, Jack Daniel, I'm from Tennessee. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and as you do it, you go by the home computer and you flip on the switch. So after Jack has made you feel better, you can come back and have more information. Uh, you know, it, it, it's terrible. Uh, it, it, more than half of us no longer live in nuclear families, which was the basis for 500 years. We now live in extended families. That's entirely different. Um, most of us live at least 40 miles away from where we were born, which means we have no contact with the village. 
and 203 different procedures to make a lead pencil now. We're that far, that's a fact. We're that far removed from the, from the source of stuff. Uh, so 203 different things happen for you to buy to con the rego. Uh, you know, a, a little country like Iran can hold us hostage. Why? Because information is more important than money. Now, if you're smart like Bill Gates, you turn information into money real quickly. But information, he who knows the most has the most. It's, it's thing after thing after thing. Um, and one of the uh, characteristics of the Great Emergence, of course, is that it's informed by the Internet in the same way that the printing press informed the Reformation, which is to say that uh, uh, life now can move horizontally. Emergence itself sounds like something's coming up out of the center, which is not where the word comes from. Uh, when sociologists called this one the Great Emergence and began to name Emergence Christianity, they were talking about emergence theory, which comes straight out of 19th century biology, and which is the study of complexity. It's the difference between an anthill uh, and, and a beehive. Uh, for centuries, we thought they both worked alike and gave them queens, and they both do have queens. Uh, but the, the queen of the beehive uh, operates top down. Uh, we had five hives in the country when the children when we were trying to teach the children how to farm and live off the land. And if you get the sixth bee, you're in a world of hurt. Uh, in the sixth queen, uh, you're just in a world of hurt because uh, you can only have one. But an ant hill does indeed have an ant, uh, does have a, a queen, but she's the original dumb blonde. Um, and this is good science. That is to say, she takes only one nuptial flight. Uh, it's a heck of a journey, but she only takes one. Um, and, and one male ant uh, mounts her, and they fly until he dies of exhaustion. And she drops to the ground wherever she is, and um, then delivers four to six uh, baby ants which she has one job in life, and that is to lick all of those four to six little creatures uh, to keep them free of bacteria, because she's on the surface of the ground at that point, to keep them free of bacteria until they can get old enough to burrow. And as they get mature, they burrow down, and she goes down one level and bears more eggs, and down and down and down, pushing up earth. And so you get these great, you know, 20 feet tall things uh, in, out in Texas and New Mexico, from one ant, she, off of one insemination, bears for about 20 years. Uh, and each time, she, it was a heck of a ride, uh, she, uh, she burrows that. You all don't laugh about raunchy jokes. But you, know. <laughs> you, you don't have seven children by the same man. It takes more imagination than I can tell you. But, anyway, uh, <laughs> but, but yeah, that's better. I, I was really worried there for a while. But, but it, it was our introduction to the, to the fact that uh, enormously complex structures can come out of non-hierarchical arrangements. They can come out this way. And ants communicate. They don't have anybody in charge. They communicate by pheromones, by odor. Uh, you know, here's food, everybody come. And we go eat. And just in the process of it, uh, letting each part contribute what he or it does best, uh, they arrive at these enormously complex things without anybody being in charge at all. And one of the characteristics of what we've got right now is nobody's in charge. It's not just the established church that's having trouble. Have you checked the figures for Rotary Club lately? Have you looked at Kiwanis? You know, have you been to the VFW, unless you're an inveterate gambler, I bet you haven't, uh, American Legion? Institution after institution is, is falling in the same way that Protestantism uh, is falling, or Protestant churches are falling. Um, and yes, they are uh, deeply concerned. It is the nature of the institution to want to protect itself above all else. That's just inherent in the institution. We, don't, we both know it. The, the saddest example right now being the Roman Catholic Church uh, in how they've dealt with the sex scandals. Uh, to protect the institution, they sacrificed people, whether that was right or wrong in, at the time or a bad judgment call, nobody knows. I'm certainly not here to judge what, what any of them did. But it's a perfect example of the institution trying to save the institution. So there are indeed um, many Protestants uh, and uh, many Catholics too. Uh, but primarily Protestants, because they're the ones that are most besieged right now, who are uh, interested in keeping the institution. Um, and uh, the, the institution is, has a demographic. Those who are over, uh, those who are under 45, 40 or 45, are emergent citizens. They were born into emergence thinking they can no more change their emergent sensibilities than they can change the color of their eyes. And those who are over 60 or 65, somewhere along in there, 
are also emergent. So I don't know whether it's senile dementia or what it is. I, you know, but uh, I mean, I'm 76, so I can crack those jokes. No, we just know uh, it doesn't work. The, yeah, yeah. Exactly. The, the, the thing about it is they can play with the technology. They, they have my brilliant husband must spend four hours a day in Facebook and other assorted forms of social networking, yeah. talking all over the bloody world, uh, you know. Um, and, and so it, it, it's amazing. So that age group and the younger age group have a, a certain shared sensibility. It's, do you know the old Carol Burnett joke about kids and their grandparents get along so well because they have a common enemy? Yeah. <laughs> there, there is a demographic in there of somewhere uh, early 40s to somewhere in the early 60s where, and we were talking, MJ and I were talking about this earlier, where they are what's called the retraditionalizing Christians. They're going back to church in droves and wanting to be more Presbyterian than John Calvin was, more Lutheran than Luther was, simply because we marry later and we have kids later. And when you've got, when you're 40 or 45 and you've got pubescent or prepubescent kids, you want the rules, baby, like, like a drunk wants his liquor. <laughs> and so you go to the institution. And that part of the institution is growing. It's the only part that's growing. The other part is indeed losing, um, losing people right and left. It's losing them to emergence Christianity, which is totally deinstitutionalized. Uh, that is to say, it meets in houses, it meets in bars, it meets in old abandoned uh, bowling alleys, um, it, it meets all our, uh, Is it Christianity? Yes, in the same way that 500 years ago Protestantism was bizarre, but it was Christianity. Um, this one is. And so, um, is Christianity dying? And by the way, if you want to see it, Judaism, Google's uh, Synagogue 3000, you probably already know that. But if you Google Synagogue 3000, you'll see the same thing in Judaism. Uh, where they're going through the same struggle uh, to figure out. So the, the institutional form of everything, especially religion, um, is, is in a world of hurt, as well it should be. Forgive me, but uh, you know, I'm not an emergence Christian, but I sure am persuaded by, by much of what they are, are doing. There is this time around, and so far as we know, it's the first of these 500-year things where this has happened. There's what's called the hyphenated. Uh, in which people who wish to keep the natal form of their Christianity or their Judaism but infuse it with emergent spirit are, are trying to be. Uh, they're Anglo-emergents, they're Presbyterians, there are Baptist-emergents, they're Luther-emergents, Methodists, which sounds like a bad drug to me every time I say it, but uh, <laughs> where they're, they're trying to merge it. But you're absolutely right. Uh, organized, organized religion is, which is going to also be the death of seminaries. Uh, emergence pastors will tell you the problem with learning to think theologically is it teaches you to think theologically. Uh, and so they're getting PhDs in secular universities, in secular subjects, uh, in order to uh, lead this movement. So it's a, it's a fascinating thing, which is part of both the cause and uh, the result of, of the coming of the spirit, of, of spirituality becoming more and more uh, a part of, uh, uh, of what we're doing. I think you next, and then you. Yes. Um, I'm curious, did you ever uh, learn anything about uh, Lawrence's life on Earth? Did I ever learn anything about Lawrence's life on that Earth? That would suggest why he yes. seems to remain yeah. Earthbound as Actually, I, I have to tell uh, Lawrence, uh, we, when we went back to Mary, Matresha, and, said, and, and she began to tell us the story, they had no children, and he was crazy about children. Uh, and had always had neighborhood children around and, and about. And they had, they ran a little uh, sundry store um, near the medical school. And they had made enough money out of that sundry uh, store to buy some other houses and to begin to get some money and uh, rent them out. And then they got this one that they were fond of. Uh, and he just wanted to have a family. And so he elected to stay there when he died and wait until somebody with a lot of kids and no sense came. Uh, and, and we qualified. Uh, and, and so, uh, and uh, I, I have to tell you, he is still with us in, in the country. Um, and uh, we don't see him often now uh, because the kids aren't there. But uh, every once in a while, uh, he lets me know that he's there. The, um, I, the Episcopal Church, uh, which is really good at woo-woo, right? I mean, uh, it bells, smells, sex appeal, you know. Um, the, uh, the Episcopal Church, it's in the canon. Uh, a canon is a human being. Uh, 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 above a rector and under a bishop. Uh, out to say that uh, the church has a name for this. And um, 
you know, we, we really think we should do a service that would allow this poor soul to go on. Uh, and that it's not yet been buried and it needs release. And um, we thought about it seriously. It was a serious offer. The canon was a friend. I'm a good Episcopalian. I understand that it's a uh, non-substantial uh, corpus and that it might want rest. And we talked about it and I said, no, I'm not ready to give him up for whatever that's worth. And uh, it was not a um, quick decision. It was a prayerful one. I don't want him uh, to leave us yet. When, when you were telling us about the other um, uh, spirit who um, yeah. was your visitor for mm -hmm. several days and then uh, recognized the need to move it's on, need to go, yeah. was she aware of Lawrence? Uh, I, I, yes, because she had been in, uh, she was my mother-in-law, so she'd been in and out of our house. Oh, yeah, she mm -hmm. knew about Lawrence. Yeah, mm -hmm. she absolutely knew about Lawrence. Did she have any thoughts about No, her? or if so, she never voiced him. Mm -hmm. You know, never voiced him. Uh, I, I have seen him uh, enough now, so it, it just wears a slouch hat and has got on an overcoat. Why in Memphis, Tennessee, you never have an overcoat is beyond me. You don't even need that in December. Uh, but uh, even the day I walked through it. So, uh, but I have never really seen a full face. It's always that. The kids say they have. I've never seen a full face. And, yes? Uh, my question is, I I think that you're very interesting and well versed in the subject. And I'll, my question is kind of personal. That's okay. You can ask a personal question. I mean, after this, what are you going to ask me that I can <laughs> That's a good question. That's not even personal. That's a, that's a good question. Of the seven children, how many fall on my pattern of thought? One of our sons is now dead, uh, but of the six surviving uh, children, uh, I think I would have to say all of them. I'm not sure how fra They were so shaped, their childhood was so shaped by this experience that he really was, at least the Lawrence part, was another part of the family. Mm -hmm. And I think it would be like denying their own parentage. Um, some are more outspoken. Our number three daughter uh, is, is very frank uh, about it. Uh, and she was the one who came in and said, he's, he's back, he's in the orchard. Um, our, our number one son, who wept when the chandelier didn't show up, um, is very outspoken about it. And it's not that the others are reticent, it just doesn't it, it come up so much. Well, I guess the, uh, our, our number seven child, the girl, fortunately, or our daddy wasn't going to come back for um, <laughs> is uh, a painter. And uh, I think it's easier for those in the professional arts, uh, landscape painter, to, to speak it. You know what I mean? They're, you're already dealing, uh, when you're in the arts, you're so used to being a conduit. You're so used to having a through uh, uh, that, I mean, uh, we were laughing today about not being able to remember what you've written in a book. I can't remember half the time because I really was the conduit, uh, however dumb that sounds. So she also is outspoken. And this woman who's in my peripheral vision out here really thinks it's 5 o'clock time to go. She's a Episcopalian. <laughs> Oh, a perfect question. Bless your heart. I, mean, I knew there was something about the way you talk. Okay. Lucy, Tennessee is uh, 35 miles and 100 years from Memphis. Uh, <laughs> because if you really look at Memphis, there's two major tributaries to the Mississippi that go uh, south and north of the city. And the one to the south got bridged uh, fairly easily because that was how the cotton came up to market in Memphis. <coughs> the one to the north never did get bridged very well. And Lucy is on is on the north side of that, uh, and but now there's a circumference. I can get to the airport in 35 minutes, which you can't do in the city, you know. It, but it's because we catch we're right near the interstate, and we just catch it, uh, and we're down to 11 acres now. We're a farmette, uh, Sam's not well, so we don't try to farm now. We haven't run a herd in 15 years, but yeah, that's where Lucy is. It used to be where the railroad stopped. It was, it was the, the railroad. If you're going, you're going to Memphis. You've got a, a, a wagon there uh, to, to take it all into town. Thank you. <laughs>